Welcome back fellow aircraft builders and aviation enthusiasts. This is part two of my Reading Zenith's Blueprints set of videos that fall under my Drafting Basics series. We're going to look at a few more complicated drawings and see how Zenith lays out information for us. Let's get into it. So the very next drawing in my particular plans package here is the exploded view of the rudder. This is essentially very similar to what an isometric drawing is, which this is showing you the pictures of the parts and how they fit together. The other drawing that we just looked at, the sample drawing that we looked at was how do you make the part and how does Zenith present that information. This is how those parts fit together. So when you get to your first section of making actual parts in the airplane, the first drawing you're gonna to come to is the exploded view of the drawing. And that's gonna show you all the parts in that particular sub assembly of the plane, in this case, the rudder, how those parts fit together and you know where, where they're located in the assembly. Now you can see here, there's no measurements on this drawing. This is basically just giving you an exploded view with the, num the parts are listed over on the right side here. We have a, a key that shows you what all parts are contained in this assembly and then a pictorial of roughly how these things go together. But there are no dimensions in here given. This is just the pictures of the parts and roughly when you, when you stretch them apart, how they kind of look. So you can see there's rivet holes denoted on the rear skin, the rear ribs here, we've got doublers, we have a spar, we have rudder brackets. Uh, here's the rudder horn and bracket, the lower one, the upper bracket here, the nose rib, the tip rib, and a bracket to attach that, and then the nose skin. So all these things are just kind of pictorially noted for us uh, so we can see how this airplane goes together. So we'll move on to the next series of drawings in this rudder assembly. So first time plans builders or the first time you start to look through your blueprints, especially because we typically start building this airplane by building the rudder. The rudder is one of the smallest sub assemblies. It's the smallest single thing you can put together in the airplane. It's obviously smaller than the wing, the stabilizer, the fuselage. Uh, the cabin and everything. It's one of the smallest pieces of this airplane that you can put together. And so typically if you're scratch building, this is where you're going to start. Now, if you've never looked at blueprints before, you've never really read blueprints before, you're looking at this page and going, my goodness, there's a ton of information on here. How can I sort through all of this stuff? Well, again, that primer that I gave you on orthographic projection and how to read blueprints basically gives us everything that we need to know. If we take a look at part number one, this is the rudder bottom rib. And again, we've only, we're only being given one drawing here. The reason for that is this is a sheet metal part. So what we need to know is how to cut out the blank and then how to bend it. We don't need a pictograph to show us how to bend it. We can see here that we've got bend angles listed on these flanges. So we've got a rear rivet flange here and then a bottom part of this flange here, which actually makes up the lower part of the skin of the rudder. And we can see all the relevant dimensions we need here to make this piece just somewhat triangular in shape. They're also giving us information here with these dash, it's a solid dash, solid dash, solid dash line series, uh, which indicates a solid object or a cutaway of a solid object. They've got this labeled form block. So we know now we've got dimensions not only to make the outline of the part itself, but we also have dimensions to make form blocks, which is how we hammer this metal around uh, a chunk of wood to make this part. Now I like to make this part mostly in a bending break uh, for the skin sides if you've got enough clearance because this tip only has an eight millimeter clearance at the very tip and you're bending very wide flanges uh, when you make this, but the back and then the back piece I formed around a form block. But Again, we've got how wide is this part, all the relevant pieces. We've got relief holes here with a dimension or a radius given to us, a diameter or a radius. I believe that's a, and that's a diameter of 4.8, which is going to be 3 16 of an inch. How tall does this flange need to be? What is the dimensions on it? When you lay these things out, you generally are going to run a center line to measure off of. So this would be four millimeters on one side of the center line, four millimeters on the other. Uh, 24 millimeters on one side of the center line, 24 millimeters on the other, so that you're making a symmetrical part. 
Again, we'll get into some of those details later in the series. But you've got all the information you need. Now this is a fairly busy drawing and there are drawings in this blueprints package that are much busier. They have more uh, datum lines. This would be a datum line here, datum line here. You can see they've given us measurements here. Now this gives us a somewhat overall measurement, but it doesn't measure to the back of the flange. But we know that the points here have to be 62 millimeters from this datum line and that the end of the tip here has to be 580 millimeters from that same data line. So generally what you're going to do is be measuring from some set of coordinates. And again, when we get into actual parts fabrication and laying out parts, we're going to talk about how to do that. So for right now, just understand that there's a lot of information on this one page, but it's all pretty clear, if you look at this, how to make this part. If we take a look at this part number, we know this is part number six. It's revision number zero. It's called the rudder nose rib. It's made out of a thickness of 25 thousandths of 6061 T6 alloy. So again, it's a piece of sheet metal. We, we know that they've inserted a form block notation here that locates where you can put tooling holes. Tooling holes are used to clamp the materials together. I have other videos on how to make form blocks and how to do tooling holes, but they've given us this here as a center line here. And there's an edge line here. Those are the two datum lines that we're going to measure off of. And we've got some basic dimensions here on where to locate things like radius, center points, uh, how thick things need to be, how wide these flanges need to be, uh, the bend angles of the flanges. Here, this is a flange. So on the pictograph, the sort of 3D image of this part, you can see that this is bent up and it's got flutes in it or crimps all along the edge. It's because you're bending over a curved surface. And as you do that, there's excess metal on the inside of the radius that needs to be taken up and the crimps do that for us. That we crimp the metal so that it follows this radius as we bend it around the form block. So again, we've got a form block here. They've given us up here a grid that shows us how do we make the form block. Everything is based on X, Y coordinates. That's why we have X and Y. This is our X line here, although they don't label that as an X. And then these are our Y lines here. Now, because this is a symmetrical part, Y is this direction and Y is this direction with zero in the center. We don't need Y1 and Y2 for top and bottom, which you'll see in other drawings, uh, because it's a symmetrical part. On things like wing ribs, rear ribs, and things like that that have a different curve on the bottom than they do on the top, you'll have a complete second set of Y coordinates to draw the curve there. But you can see here, we've got measurements for the form block that basically tell us how to achieve this curve. We're going to measure X from zero out to Y. So here would be 42.5. We're going to measure out 50 millimeters from zero and up 50 and then so on. 100, 150, 200, 250, 275 until we get coordinates that are strategically located along this line that will allow us to connect the dots and make that curve. But all that information is there, and then they give us the spacing on the crimp locations to take up the extra material we're going to run into. So it's very simple. You can see they've done that over here for the tip rib. We've got straight bends for the rear ribs over here, so there's no, there's no coordinates, but the tip rib also has curves. It has coordinates. We've got bend angles for the flanges. And again, I've got another video that shows you how to make these form blocks. But uh, moving over here, then we have some simple parts. We've got a bent strip, and that, that attaches the tip the rudder tip rib to the spar, and then the spar doubler, of which there are two required. Again, only one drawing, because we know how thick the material starts out as. They tell us how long it needs to be, and then we just have to fabricate it to these dimensions. Here they do not list a developed length, which would be how wide you need to make the part when it's flat. Because everybody has a different bending break and everybody's going to use different methods to build these parts, the Developed length is often only appropriate for whatever zenith, whatever method zenith uses to make their parts on. If you use a different way to bend it or you clamp it on one side or bend it on a different side uh, than they would using their commercial equipment, you may end up with a different result. So a little, there's a little bit of experimentation involved in making some of these parts and a lot of, a lot of people complain, well, there's no developed length. I don't know what dimension to start from. You will get used to figuring out what your developed length needs to be based on the equipment that you're going to use to do it. Uh, I can't really say it any simpler than that. Developed length is often uh, a double-edged sword. If Zenith gives you a developed length, 
uh, and you cut your part blank to the width of the developed length, but then you don't bend it in exactly the same way that they bent it, you're not going to get the same part. And I have other videos on how to factor that in and, and do those things. So right now we're just talking about drawings, but that's why it's not included on some of these things. Either it just doesn't need to be included or it would actually do you more harm than good, uh, which is my opinion, is that it would do more harm than good if they gave you that developed length on everything. So let's take a look at the other section of the drawing. Here's the second page of rudder drawings. And these are basically your skins, some bushings, uh, some hinge angles, and the rudder horn itself. So again, now we've got the rudder horn here. This is made out of uh, eighth inch plate. This is a 125 thousandths thickness, 6061 T6 aluminum. And they've given you a bend line. So remember we have a long line, a dash, long, dash, long, dash, long, dash. That indicates a bend line rather than a hidden line. We have a series of dimensions uh, located. And again, drawing these is different you might say, well, there's no edge datum here and here, noting how far to put certain things. Well, this is a symmetrical part, so often you have to figure out that there's a center line here that you need to measure off of. The reason that these edges are not depicted by a measurement here is because they're drawn with a radius. You're either going to use a compass or a circle template to draw these based off of where the coordinate is located rather than the edge of the part. So the way that I fabricated this was I basically drew a center line, I measured from that center line to my relevant parts and pieces uh, with these measurements and um, then drew my circles and my tangent lines and everything else and then I had my part blank and then of course they give us the bend dimension and what this thing is supposed to look like when it's all done. So you can see here radius 6.4. This is a thicker piece of material. It needs a larger radius to bend around. We've got a quarter inch radius here. They need a 30 degree uh, bend angle from where the part sticks out the back, or rather the front of the rudder, where the rudder cables attach here and here, and then this is a lower hinge. Now, when we talked about orthographic projection earlier, this is one of those cases where this is an orthographic projection. We don't have three drawings, we have two. This is the top view of the rudder. And if we project those dimensions over to the right, this is going to be the edge or side view of the rudder. So you'll notice the bend line, if we were to carry this line all the way across, comes here to where the angle bends. And they tell us that this needs to be 58 millimeters. So that's what we would clamp in our, in our uh, bending brake. Clamp 58 millimeters. The sight line would be at the top of the brake. We would see that and then bend that flange up 30 degrees. And that, was give, that would give us where these are. Now one note, when you actually go to fabricate this part, Bending that little bit of material up 30 degrees is extremely difficult, so what you actually want to do is make the part a little large and then cut these parts out later. You're going to want to draw them on there, but then you would want to cut them out later and finish it off that way. If you were just to make this exactly like this and then try to fold up these little three tabs on that bend line, you wouldn't be able to do it even on a very heavy-duty brake. The material just isn't going to, going to do that for you. So again, that's a little bit off topic. We're talking about fabrication, but this gives us the dimensions we need the part. Again, learning your own tools, learning how your bending brake fabricates for you, how it works. That's a little bit of experimentation, trial and error, but that's, you know, on the builder, that's part of the fun of scratch building is learning how to do it. Zenith doesn't hold your hand all the way. In fact, they don't hold your hand at all. This is just a set of blueprints. They've given you basic information. It's your job to figure out how to do it with your shop tools your skills and what you have available. And many, many builders use many, many different ways to do it. So this is basically going to be blueprints interpretation, but keep in mind there may be times where you have to leave a part large in order to be able to fabricate it and then cut it down later. Over here we have uh, the upper rudder hinge uh, bracket or angles. This is uh, a different kind of part. This is actually made from extruded 3 quarter inch by 3 quarter inch by 093 inch aluminum angle. So you don't form this. This is also orthographic projection. If we were looking straight down on the top of a piece of extruded angle, we would see the flat piece of the angle here. And then this line denotes the edge of the angle. And then if you were to look at this piece of material straight on, so this would be what I would call the top view although it really doesn't matter because it, there's two of them and it depends on what orientation they go on the airplane. But basically you have one face of it that shows you the edge of the angle here and then the flat side. 
and then you have another face of it that shows you the edge of the angle here and, and, uh, and the flat side. Now what they don't have here are a series of little tiny hash marks that denote where this trapezoidal piece is, but I mean that, that's basically unnecessary in a drawing like this. So how we're going to fabricate this, we're going to cut a 95 millimeter piece of aluminum angle. We're then going to trim it 37 and a half inches inward so that there's a 20 millimeter flat section here and we're done. We're going to make this part out of extruded three quarter by three quarter inch material using a 093 inch thick material. I will tell you 93 thousandths thick is a custom extrusion from Zenith Aircraft. It's expensive and it's only available from them as far as anybody knows at this point or as far as I know. So most of us scratch builders elect to bump it up to eighth of an inch, but that does require uh, a little bit of creativity on some of these dimensions occasionally where it's relevant because uh, bolt hole locations and things like that get a little dicier when you're used starting with thicker material. So just keep that in mind. But uh, at last I knew you were not able to find 93 thousandths inch extruded angle anywhere except Zenith themselves. To have them ship even one piece of 12 foot extruded angle or two six foot pieces or whatever is very expensive. So uh, most of us just get eighth inch locally, three quarter by three quarter by 125 thousandths or eight, eighth inch thick. That's pretty much it for blueprints interpretation on this specific drawing. That's just a primer on how to read Zenith's blueprints. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. For more information about the Zenith Stoll CH750, please visit Zenith Aircraft Company online at www.zenithair.net. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. Be sure to click on the notification bell to receive all the channel updates. For additional information on the project, check out my blog at gregsplane.blogspot.com. You can also contact me directly at gregsstollch750 at gmail.com. As always, thanks for watching and good luck with your projects.